statistics around well-being and resilience. I'm going to go like all good sociologists do, go from that high level macro stuff right down to the micro, so I'm going to give you the overview picture, then go down to some specifics of the, some of the projects, similar to what Steve's talking about there, but I'm focusing more on their evaluation using a resilience framework. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some common denominators um, that I see as being um, factors that are Similar, if not the same, for a lot of the community and voluntary groups that are using digital arts. Um, so I'll, I'll move forward. Now this, is, this little thing here is, is a joke. Right? There isn't a, a formula. This was, this was me just using Prezi for the first time I've ever used Prezi, and I thought I'd maybe come up with a E equals MC squared. But I, th I think there's something in there, actually. I mean, if you look closely at that, as I go through the presentation, you'll see... That, that does actually make sense a little bit. I didn't think that through. That's not, that's not actually a, a, the structure of my presentation, but it does kind of make sense. Okay, so what the book does is advocates for a broad definition of resources. You've got your obvious examples whenever you think of resources, physical things, money, um, places, things like that, but then you can also think about people as resources. You can think about... Um, the project, once that project has been completed, becoming a resource for another project to use. Um, people becoming resources themselves once they've worked through a particular program and then they get that inspiration to then start a new program, they then become a, a resource themselves. So we're certainly interested in the broadest possible understanding we can, can of resources. And in the, um, in the intro chapter there, I gave... I unpack this definition a lot more, but this is my favourite definition of resilience at the moment right across the board. It's a three-part definition. I'll just give you a second to read it. see that resources figures fairly heavily there and it's, um, it's a specific sort of um, definition that tries to involve as many people in individual and community um, approaches to resilience as possible. The social, social and physical ecologies. So like I said, I unpack that a lot more and get, go into a lot more detail, but that's a good starting point for us today. And what we did with this book was we created a wiki that came with it. So we, before the book actually came online, we started inviting people that we knew um, who we were interested in inviting to write a chapter because of particular um, projects that they were working on. And we set this wiki up. And in, in the same way that, that that definition talks about a resource in that sense, you can call that wiki an extra resource that comes with the book. So... Obviously, you can't put music and film and, and you can put photographs, black and white copies of the photographs in the book. But to get the full picture of a project like the one that Steve just did, delivered or, or the one that Bob's going to talk about, it, it's really hard to get that all in. So the idea is that you're reading a book and looking at a wiki at the same time so that you've got this extra supporting bit of information. Now, I'm going to go to that and um, show you a few bits about it later on. But that's just my, my intro, really. And the next thing I wanted to do was just talk to you. I'm not going to give you a, a, a lot of this, but I just want to give you a snapshot of where, when we were writing this book, um, where people were going with this resilience. It just feels like a real, it felt like a trendy buzzword at the time. The moment, just, uh, Steve came to us with, hey, everyone's talking resilience up at the moment, okay? It's going on here and there, and schools and health departments and all the rest of it. And I started doing some more research on this, um, just on the macro level. Now, I'm not a um, statistical analyst, but I do like to look at that level of, of detail on that high stuff. So, 
The ones that we're going to talk about very quickly here are the spirit level analyses, and they talk about well-being indicators all mapped against income inequality. Every indicator that they do. Now, that's, that's a separate issue to what we're talking about today, um, a different discussion about causality. Um, but basically, every one of their graphs shows income inequality across the bottom and different well-being indicators at the side. And I'm just going to run you through a few of those, and there's some really striking sort of examples of where Australia fits and where you think it probably fits as a developed country in, in relation to the rest of the world. The other ones that I found were from the BBC. The BBC uses resilience in its professional development for all its staff. It's a key concept. And what they've done is that's been then taken on um, by some um, national government department that knew that there was huge budget cuts coming in England. So they're actually building up these ginormous rankings of every ward in the UK at the moment based on its business community, people and place things and coming up with a resilience ranking. If we take X amount of um, budget cuts, public service cuts from this particular thing, what is its resilience factor for coping with that sort of stuff? So I'm not going to go into any more detail than that, but it's just to give you this overview of where people are indicating on that big macro level, on that they're aggregating studies from Australia through the rest of the world, through the ABS stats and putting them all together. And these are the sort of things that they're showing. So this first one is um, just trying to show you roughly where um, the countries go in terms of poor and rich and income inequality gap. This, and we'll see that this income one's across the bottom and all these things go down the side. So I'm going to do a very quick flip through this. I'll leave them on the screen for five seconds each. It's, um, I, I don't really want to do too much on this, but look at this. Teenage birth rates are higher in countries with more, in, sorry, are higher in more unequal rich countries. So you can see teenage birth rates, Australia, UK, pretty high. And this book is just full of them. The pattern just keeps on going. Okay, this is mental illness, Australia and the UK up there, USA right up at the top, Japan, Netherlands and Belgium further down the bottom. And the pattern is just so striking, it just keeps on going. Child, be child well-being. Obesity. And these are all the standard indicators of well-being that people like the United Nations are choosing to um, focus on. Drug use. Australia's right at the top on that one. Interesting. And this was a compendium of all those ones. These are some of the most common well-being indicators that, are, that you can aggregate across country. Okay, and I'm just going to spin through these now. Just to, you, You've got the idea. Just, just have a quick look. Uh, the last one that really interested me, I thought, was this is a measure of... There we go. I don't know truly if this is a measure of innovation... But this is, this is how many patents per country. It is a measure of innovation in a way. Interesting graph. And I think the last one was trust. It's a big one that they, they, they use in the well-being literature. Okay. And there's a little a snapshot, of, a snapshot, sorry, snapshot of the BBC stuff. And I'm not going to dwell on that, but there's just heaps of these ranking systems. Now, the reason I've done that is I'm, I'm convinced that these are the conditions that face the sort of people that um, we're interested in engaging as a university. Um, all the different types of people that work in artistic practices in different voluntary and community group settings. Um, and there is a big debate around performing arts and particularly some of the, the highbrow performing arts and public subsidy of those things, but I don't think that argument makes sense for the small to medium-sized um, voluntary sector, non-profit um, sort of sector of anything under 250 people, basically, that sort of size is what I'm suggesting, that um, public funding isn't going to just dry up for projects like these, but, but it's certainly going to become more and more competitive. And the final comment down there is, especially when these well-being ecological views of um, health and, and education systems are becoming more and more prevalent after we've had a devolution of decision-making power to the local level. So I think that's a, I think that's a significant point. 
And there's one other quote that I want to give you. This quote here comes from a guy who's just done an evaluation of all the arts projects um, in Australia, arts evaluation projects to do with health. And the phrasing that he uses here is secondary instrumental benefits. So there's this acknowledgement that all these people who are working in community settings know that there are a whole range of well-being and resilience um, say it, processes going on and potentially outcomes that they don't focus fully on, that's not their main goal, but they know that they're there and, and he's, he's calling them secondary instrumental benefits to reflect the interests of non-arts portfolios. I really like that quote, I think that's a really spot on point. Um, and what I can think we can say about that, you've said already, yeah, it's going to become more competitive. Um, Qualitative case studies just aren't enough anymore, I'm afraid. The play, it's a big, you know, the world is a big place and there's people aggregating the re, all the research outcomes of Australia and looking at them in comparison to the, you know, you've seen the level of stuff that's got. Um, qualitative case studies don't find their way into those statistical things very well. Um, now, I'm a qualitative researcher by trade, but that doesn't mean that I can't find ways of putting numbers and statistics into my research to make sure that they <coughs> heard, um, get, get counted, basically. What counts is what I'm talking about here. All right, so that's the macro. And then we go to the micro and the songs of resilience. And I'm not going to go through these in detail. I'm, in fact... Actually, because of the session and the way it's gone today with the, with the room change, I'm not actually going to play you a snip of each of these. I'm just going to give you a quick description of them. Um, but these are some micro examples that come from this book about um, people who are responding to this resilience and well-being framework. Marcel Melto was a guy um, who works out in Vanuatu. He's come over to Australia a few times as a, as a cultural ambassador for Vanuatu. Um, he, when he came here last, we recorded um, a bamboo flute um, narrative that he did. He did a, sang as a little song, and he also does these fantastic sand drawings. If we get time at the end, that's the one that I'll put on for you. He draws in the sand, he scrubs it out as he's going. His the ground is the palette. It tells the story. His finger never lifts off the sand. It's fantastic art form, and he now presents himself as a as a, a resource for others to use in. In Vanuatu, he, that's the way he sees himself, and he uses the language of resilience um, when he describes the sort of processes he went through as a as a young boy and, and now as a, as an ambassador for for Vanuatu. The second one there that I want to talk about is Hagholm. There's a chapter in the book from a guy from Sweden who's a librarian, and he had a uh, Steve met him a few years ago, and he had a, a fascination with an old. Uh, music teacher, disabled music teacher called Hagholm, who he, he was, as a librarian, he started giving you the whole, um, um, he started looking up all these old texts, and what he's got on this website here is transcripts of those original um, melody parts that this guy played on a fiddle, and how he's managed to engage different disabled communities around the place using this particular very old form of music. The other one is Songs for Survival. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it, but we might push something on the end. But the last one there, Hype, Hip Hop for Health. This came from um, Griffith Health Department. And the reason that I want to flag it up is it used these statistics, but they were very simple. It did a big breakdancing competition that it puts on every year and brings a whole heap of um, Pacific Islander kids together from different local schools and puts on a fantastic event. They responded to the well-being and uh, resilience indicators using obesity statistics in the area and how dance through hip-hop music was an active... I think the first title they had for their piece was It's the First Time My Son's Got Active, talking to a dad about his use on the project. And all they did was attendance statistics and post-participation surveys. Are you more active now than you were eight weeks ago? This is pretty basic stuff, but when you present, it in, you present the, the form and the, the way that this chapter works with qualitative and quantitative data put there together, it's probably the most powerful argument in the book. Um, 
And that's all I'm going to say about that stuff. I hope that you go and have a look at it. But these are the reasons that I think hype, what, what that last chapter does well. It's audio message, audio visual messages are well received because they're high, authentic and high quality. And it used simple but effective measures. Attendance and post-participation surveys. Now, one of my favourite social theorists is Manuel Castells. And he did a book called The Power of Identity in 97. And I just want to use this framework here because he talks about social movements from around the world and which ones have been successful, which ones haven't, which ones have used technology well to focus their aims. And I think that there's some common denominators here for the sort of projects that are in this book and hopefully some of the people that are here today. Um, around resistance, this is how um, social movements often start. They resist something legitimate. Um, a disability organisation might be resisting the normal sort of focus that uh, an education institution might have towards people with disabilities. They might start off, their movement might be resistant in the first instant, but if it wants to change things and bring about change, it moves itself into a project that sort of aims to redefine things. So disabilities example would be, we used to call it, say, disabled people, and part of the, the social movement that is the disabilities movement has, has redefined that so that we say people with disabilities. This becomes second. It's a concerted effort of thousands of people over um, a long, long time. But it, I, I think it's got some, there's seriously some relevance and some common ground around this stuff. The second one that I wanted to do was the funding, I've already talked about, was the way that you have to evaluate and fund these things. There's a set of questions there that I think could come, we could come back to depending on how that discussion goes at the end of these sessions. And the other common denominator again is just this stuff about audio-visual messages. Castell's most recent book, 2010, talks about communication power and says that regardless whether you're Rupert Murdoch or you're the young lad with his new home studio set up using YouTube, you're still having to frame your messages through the same protocols, through the same internet service providers, the same barriers, the same gatekeepers are there for us all. Um, so I think, I think that that's the key point that I want to try and pass on to Bob now with. We have an imminent national broadband coming. Okay, It might be five years away, it might be seven, I'm not going to say how long we think that's going to happen. But once that does, surely all the non-profit, voluntary organisations that use the arts to engage people will be looking to use this new high-speed broadband to send out um, promotional materials about what they do, evaluations of what they do. And this is a promise, and there's great possibilities in it, but I'm going to hand you over now to, to Bob, who might talk about a little bit. I think there was one last bit there, was the, yeah, the National Broadband and the Wearing Promise. All right, let's go. <laughs>